I need a piece of your honey. We're almost home. I can't make it here on my own. You'll be the first one. I'll be the Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Spoiler Warning Podcast, where we are reviewing a little film called Return to Soul. I am Christopher Schnazy, and I'm recording this intro um, before I even sit down to edit this episode. Uh, basically, as you've probably heard from the teases we've been doing on probably the last, like it feels like many, many episodes, um, we actually recorded this several months back um, and we've kind of just been sitting on it. You know, it kind of fell between some things. Episodes got a little backed up and we kept just putting it off, putting it off, missed the VOD release of the film later on. And, uh, you know, we've been sitting on it, but uh I just dropped into the feeds our review of Past Lives, um, and we figured that this is thematically relevant to that film, and we might as well drop this in as a bonus episode now. So I'm recording a new intro. As I mentioned, I'm recording this before I even sit down to edit that episode, so I am just going to completely forego any type of continuity at all, and I am just going to drop you in to right before we listen to the trailer for the film, and then let the rest of the episode play out as is. Um, so, uh, yeah, hope you enjoy, and uh, we'll be back soon with uh, more recent films. Later. All right, we're going to take a listen to the trailer for Return to Soul, which, depending on what parts of the film are covered in the trailer, you're probably going to get a mix of Korean, French, and English. So, uh, enjoy, enjoy the trailer. No, yeah. How long do you want to stay? I don't know yet, but uh, three nights. I need your passport, please. Mais vous êtes française? Ah, c'est pas mal. Ah, c'est pas mal. Ah, c'est pas mal. Ah, c'est pas mal. Ah, c'est pas C'est ta mère? Biologique, je pense, ouais. Tu vas essayer de retrouver tes parents? Pourquoi nous? Mais je suis française. T'es aussi un peu coréenne. Votre prénom de naissance est Yon Hee. On pourrait dire docile et joyeuse. Ton père, il a toujours pensé à toi. Il y a des signes partout qu'on voit pas parce qu'on sait pas les reconnaître. Faut savoir évaluer les dangers et paf, se jeter à l'eau. <rire> Sex again, you and me. Okay. What is your job? Missile Parayo. La James Bond girl. Et je me suis toujours posé la même question le jour de mon anniversaire. Est-ce que ma mère a une pensée pour moi? All right, so that was the trailer for Return to Seoul. It is about a woman who was born in Korea and then adopted by a French family and has grown up like basically her whole life in France. And due to, I guess, uh, so, some travel uh, issues, she ends up making her way back to Seoul. And uh, while she's there, she's like, I guess maybe I should try to check in on these whole birth parents thing. And it's sort of about the journey she goes on trying to find and reconnect with uh, the family that uh, she never knew. Stephen Miller, what did you think of Return to Seoul? So going in, I thought I knew what this movie was going to be. I, I figured it would be a kind of... I'm not even going to name the touch points because Carson's going to make fun of me if I reference that Sophia Coppola movie one more time. But I, I thought this was going to be the sort of movie that is like soaking in a place, have very emotional moments that she, the main character, tries to figure out how she fits in, how does she belong, looking for this thing from her past. I, I thought I knew the emotional things the movie was going to do, the way it was going to make me cry. And the truth is, this made me cry far less and think 
far more than I was expecting it to <laughs> as a movie. Um, this film, it is... So the character of Freddy, uh, the character at the center, played by Jimin Park, who has never been in a film before. She was basically found by the director, and this is her first star role. Are you role. my dad? <laughs> <laughs> she, she is so... The character is has a chaotic energy. The character doesn't want to dwell too deeply on the pain that she has, whatever lingering feelings she has about being adopted. So instead, she will steer aggressively into any kind of distraction she can. And it's like the whole movie embodies her personality. <laughs> there, there is a scene very early in the movie where she's having a conversation and we think we are in the purely emotional uh, young woman meeting her biological parents movie. And she's having conversations with these two people who are kind enough to take her out to dinner and drinks. And she's talking and the subject of adoption comes up. And in that moment, rather than answer their question, she suddenly has this kind of glint in her eye and is like, have you ever heard of sight reading Let's go. And the whole tone of the movie just like shifts with her. <laughs> like the the movie is sight reading. The movie is doing this thing where they're like, we don't know what is going to happen next, but we are just going to follow whatever this person would do. And I thought it was a wonderful movie that was also very prickly and challenging, which is why I texted you immediately after and said, there is a 60% chance you will not like this movie. <laughs> um We'll, we'll find out if you did or not, because this is not the, I don't want to say straightforward because I'm not saying like people need a straightforward movie, but this movie is intentionally like the character of Freddy holding you at arm's length for a while, not letting you get inside the deep sadness that she feels. It is saying, hey, look over there at this shiny object and like swerving around um and the character of freddie is nothing like me you know a part of this movie is about a culture shock specifically about a woman who grew up in france which is very you know liberated kind of there, there's this feeling of we can do what we want when we want we don't need to be bogged down by customs or traditions and then being thrust into korea specifically to people in Korea who have a very kind of conservative outlook, a very traditional outlook of like, this is the path that is laid out for you. This is how you should behave. This is what is expected of you in romantic lives. And she is pushing back against it so much. She is impulsive. She steers into conflict. She wants to make things uncomfortable. She is the opposite of me. And there were multiple moments in this movie, including one you mentioned on a bus <laughs> before we were recording, where I was just like, cringing in my soul of like no no don't don't do this don't be chaotic go to your biological parents cry do the movie do the movie that i want you to be um and then about like halfway through the movie first of all there is an amazing dance sequence that i loved so goddamn much in the movie and then i almost don't even want to say it but there is a cut there is a jump with subtitles <laughs> like like with, where, with a title change where, and we are in where it becomes cyberpunk <laughs> yeah and for we are in just like a totally new movie and from then on i just had no idea what the movie was going to do and i found it totally captivating and the big crying moment does ultimately happen but it has put you through so much on the way there i just thought it was this was just a really interesting, inventive, energetic movie, and I was totally into it, and the old people around me hated it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, that seems seems about accurate. <laughs> so as an old... No, <laughs> So, you know, as you said, you would text me because you saw it while I was watching. While I was getting boxed around in my 40X chair, you were sitting in a little an old theater watching uh, this film with old people. And uh, right. you text me. And as you, as you said, you said there's a 60% chance that you won't like this film. And I think that it's probably safe to say there's an 80% chance that I liked 60% of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that that dance sequence that you talked about, that's the hard cut for where I fell off this film. 
I think mm. it wasn't, like I said, 80%. I was there up until the cut after that dance sequence. Um, I think, you know, part of the, part of the problem is 100%. I mean, all of the problem is 100% me. But part of it is just that, and we've talked about this in the past in in lots of other films that deal with, like, adoption that, you know, and, like, I, you know, I'll, you know, I'll cop to this now. Like, I grew up, I, I was not adopted. I don't know what it feels like to be adopted, to, to have your life change when you find this out, depending on what age you are when you find it out. But to me, in my head, just analytically, the people that raise you are your family, and it doesn't matter if you were born to somebody else that doesn't change the fact that your family is the family that raised you. And like, I, I kind of have this weird tie to like the people, like if I suddenly found out that my parents were not my parents, I don't think it would change my relationship to them. It would, it, it would just be like a thing that I learned, but it would be like, well, I don't know who those other people are. So I don't understand the drive to just to want to find my birth parents because I haven't lived that experience. Um, and mm -hmm my brain thinks about it too much and I don't know how to feel it because I'm too busy, like un trying to understand why it should matter to me. And like, so I, 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 right. I, I get hung up on that a lot. So, it, so that's one barrier for me to enter this film. Um, the other barrier I think that prevent, I mean, besides like if you had on your bingo card, the job that she has after the hard cut, <laughs> like the, I, I, you know, tell me what next week's lotto numbers are because <laughs> you are a psychic or something, right? Like, it, like, it, yep. Like this film has these two different like time jumps and cuts that like felt very, very strange to me, and I had a hard time just sticking with the story after that. But ultimately, for me, I, I'm going to do a like my, one of my one of my modes on this podcast is to make wild comparisons to films yep. that have nothing to do with the content we're talking about but I'll try to make this stretch so that you can explain the way I'm analyzing it. Um, a while back, we went to a festival and uh, we saw a little film, uh, a little sc Scottish film about um, yep. people that live in a town where a lot of suicides were taking place. And mm -hmm. one of the things, the reason why that film didn't connect with me is it felt like that was a story reverse engineered from a fact about this town in Scotland where a lot of youth commit suicide. And it was a story that was sort of built to try to live in the world where that is a true fact and then go from there. This film feels a lot to me. And I know that like, it's not going to hit everybody this way, but it feels a lot like there is this true fact that over the course of these many different years, a lot of children were adopted and taken out of Korea and that somebody wanted to tell a story about what it might be like to be one of those people who were adopted and taken away. But for me, this character, Freddie, never, I never thought that this was a story that was truly about identity. Like she didn't want to be Korean. She never missed being Korean. She didn't care about being Korean. She just on her birthday every year would wonder if her mom ever thinks about her, her, her birth mom. Mm -hmm. And to me, there was a disconnect between the journey she is saying she is going on and what it actually means to her. Um, and I, I, it, it, for me, there was just some sort of disconnect that, that made me wonder what the story was about because it felt less about identity and belonging and more about this one thing that's been nagging in the back of my head my entire life, right? Which, which to me, maybe those are the same thing. Mm -hmm. But for me, it felt like a, a idea about what happens when you take somebody away from their home and they grow up, they grow up as a you know foreigner and don't know what, what like, you know, what it was like to be with the family that they could have grown up with. And instead it was just about this wild girl. Um, you know, this film on, on some level, this film could be called uh, the, the worst daughter in the world. Right? Like it, it's, I was waiting for when the worst person in the world comparison would come up. Cause it, it honestly feels kind of ripe for this yeah. movie, even though I can't explain why. Yeah. And, it, and it's like when, when she's just starting out, I liked her chaos. I, it, it felt like a little bit like a mistress America. No, uh, no, Francis yeah. Ha, Francis Ha. Sorry. Uh, it felt like a little bit like that chaos, but like you want her to be okay, but you also know that she's doing this to herself, but it's also kind of fun. And it's like, you're, you're playing around in, in like that world. And it's, you know, it's, 
I was enjoying it. But there is a point where she actually is able to get in touch with some people from, you know, some of her, a parental type person right. is made contact with. And the way she reacts to that kind of just made me stop being sympathetic towards the character. And it's kind of mm -hmm. like if, if you if you go out of your way to achieve something and it's not everything that you thought it would be, you have made that you've you've done the connecting there, right? Like that, that's kind of like a, it's like a thing where it is a very disruptive act to show up in somebody's life and be like, hey, I'm the daughter you gave up. <laughs> Hang out with me. Yeah. And then if you don't think they're that cool, you did that. You need to deal with it. You can't just be the chaotic energy that you are. Like this character actively, uh, I don't know. I, I just found them, it, they, they lost my sympathy with the way they were behaving and the way they were acting. And then the way their life ebbs and flows from that sort of decision of who they want to be then. And it's like, a lot of stuff gets added and thrown into this story of this character. But all of that, as weird as it is, is really just her stalling for years at a time so she can send three letters. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it, it just feels like it, it becomes this weird thing where it's like, did you really have to invent that sort of story for this character as just the her stalling so that she can try to contact a person again? And it, it just felt like I, I just fell out of whatever I was feeling that vibed with the film at the beginning because of the journey it was trying to take me on. Mm. See, th this is interesting because it's making me think more about what I think. First of all, I don't think the film is a message film. So say me talking about what the message of the film is, is take it with a grain of salt. Cause I think this movie is intentionally kind of prickly and doesn't want to be saying one thing. Yeah. But if I could pick a thing that it's saying, you know, you talk about identity and belonging. And in general, what does it mean to be adopted? Like, you and I haven't lived that life. I, on paper, I can understand the kind of trauma or at least the, like, the things that you might feel as you grow up that you have to unpack that you don't really have a name for. But again, I can't analytically understand it. And I think the movie is saying Freddie doesn't know what it means to her either like she also doesn't know if this is just a a random fact of her life that doesn't matter but she's just curious or if this is a deep-seated thing that means a lot to her she can't decide which it is and the movie kind of toggles between that two like the the whole movie is kind of wrestling with how important is this like who are these people to me what what is this doing and I honestly don't know if my read on the movie is that having been given up for adoption was a root cause of a lot of the... I'll, I'll say later in the movie, it is easier to call her self-destructive rather than just chaotic. And you could say that that is a root cause, that that's some like psychological link. But it could also be that she is a young person living her life, going into an existential crisis, and this is the thing she projects it onto. Like, this is the hope that she brings, is this will explain who I am in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think the movie, from the moment of us not actually knowing if her story of how she got to Seoul is her lying to her adopted parents or actually true, the movie can't quite tell what this all means to her. And if I'm giving what might be a kind of like paternalistic read of the movie, I think the time jumps are the movie saying that life is messy and complicated and maybe you weren't ready to accept things at the time that you thought you wanted to accept them. Maybe when you were 25 and you thought you needed this answer, you actually couldn't have handled the answer and you wouldn't know how to deal with it and you would have fucked it up. But it's okay because life is long and you're going to get more and more bites of the apple and we are going to watch her kind of go through all of this until she is finally at an emotional place where maybe she is ready to receive the receive the emotional meaning of connecting with her family, even if there's no verbal answer that it gives her. And that, to me, that was kind of like Francis Ha that you mentioned. I maintained that that Francis Ha feeling of like, you are kind of, 
self-destructing, but I understand why. And it's okay because you are going to work it out, you know? And, and when this movie did the time jumps and gave us future, 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 I felt like it was giving me a thing that these movies normally don't, which is getting to actually see the way you evolve over time and the people that you hate, you stop hating. And the, like, the, I, I don't know. There, there was something about it that I really liked the time jump thing. And I don't think it was because the movie said she is so persistent. We need to find a device to say that she's biding her time. I think the movie wants to say she fucked up the first encounter. She was not in a place to do it right. This, she's not in a place to do it right after the first time jump, but we're going to watch her get there. But, and they, yeah. Uh, it doesn't not sympathize with her either. It just, I also don't think the movie is saying good for her. I think it like, it wants us to be like, Oh, Freddie, don't please don't, don't say that to him. Look at how sad he is. And like you said, like <laughs> you, you brought this. It, I don't know. I, I think the movie wants us to have all of these reactions basically. Yeah. I, I guess just for me, there, there's the stuff it chooses to tell me. I can't not think about, right? Like, they constantly cut mm. back to this, like, look, legally, we are allowed to send three emails, and if they don't respond, you have to wait a year. Mm. She she is visiting Seoul for a week or two weeks or whatever it is, right? And then she has to go. There's times where she is like, I leave in two days, I, if I'm going to meet you, it has to be like tomorrow, basically, whatever. Um, then she goes and has this whole life, but she's currently living in Seoul. So she never went back to France. How long has she been there? She's been there for two years. Uh, there are lines that reference six emails. <laughs> so it's like, it feels like she, which, which the weird thing too is, I mean, I guess she, if somebody ever responds to the email, she has to be able to immediately meet them. Um, but she just uprooted, like, the, this is a character who constantly says, I am not Korean, I am French. I like it that way or whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. So she just completely uprooted her life and became a... She, she became a Lord of War? <laughs> you are missing one time jump. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I, yeah, I guess the first time jump is where she meets the guy <laughs> who mm -hmm. makes her Lord of War. I, I I can't tell you like the the backflips that my brain started doing when I was like, are they are they speaking in euphemism? This is his actual job. <laughs> I was like, what the hell am I watching right now? It was it was so it was it was very it was a very very strange experience I had. Watching I I film. loved how far it went, but I it certainly that was not realism. I don't I don't know what it was, but it was, whatever it was, I was totally on the wavelength. And when it becomes a kind of cyberpunk movie for a little while, I was I was rolling with it hard. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what's so funny is <laughs> like about it that that first time jump is like the poster for this film, right? Like that is like the mm -hmm. shot of her looking back over her shoulder. I had com yeah. I had completely forgot that look <laughs> until I was like, oh, it's the poster shot. I'm like, what is, what is happening right now? Like, <laughs> Right. Well, because it feels like, because the time jumps are not, it, it's funny how I was being coy about time jump, but now we're like just full on going to talk about it, but it's fine. <laughs> um, the, the first time jump, if my memory serves, comes like, more than halfway through the movie so like the movie does feel for a while like it is going to be sort of the farewell or something right like we this is going to be about you connecting with family in a place that you you see as you don't see it as your identity but you know you are connected to it and you're not sure the outline of that and it felt like it was going to be this very straightforward story and then when that happens i'm like oh yeah that was the poster. This is not the movie I was watching. Yo. And I, I just kind of love how it gives us two or three different movies in one that track the different parts of her life. And maybe this is why The Worst Person in the World does come up in my mind, too, because this is kind of like we are showing you a sort of coming of age story in all the different genres that the main character wants to play in for the different ways that she came of age. I don't know. I I liked it. I also think the original name 
that it had a can is just really great and i wish they kept it which is all the people i'll never be which i think is is the vibe of the movie is she's exploring all the different outfits she could wear like all the different personalities that she could grow up into in her mid 30s 40s however we define grow up it, in my definition i haven't grown up yet so yeah <laughs> we'll see and you you referenced uh without naming it i think the party's just beginning before yeah, yeah. um and that is another one where i think that is actually a really great comparison point because that is also a movie about existential dread and feeling like your life doesn't add up to anything and how what kind of self-destructive acts might you do in that situation and like i believe you talk about her uprooting her life what did she do that for but there are things sprinkled throughout even the first part of this movie where her fam her mom is like is that really why you left? Like, she's hinting, like, you might have been in trouble. There might have been things that weren't going well. Like, it, we get the sense that this is a person that she just does things on a whim and is looking for a purpose in life. And I kind of believe that she's the kind of person who is on a one-week trip who will then stay for two years. Yeah. Um, that, that kind of seems like where she is in life right now and what she will do and... She will tell herself it has absolutely nothing to do with her biological parents. And yet all it takes is a couple nights having a few too many drinks and feeling a little weepy and you decide to have the telegram get sent again. And I think it's a movie that is leaving out a lot of those in between times. But I see it as like Karen Gillan in The Party's Just Beginning, like a person who doesn't know what to live for and they think they want self-destructive and then it it lets us see what comes after self-destructive in a way that worked worked for me. I don't know what the very ending means, by the way, <laughs> but I, I enjoyed it anyway. I mean, I, I definitely think it's supposed to be a question for you, the watcher, like, right, is right is whatever conversation is about to co happen mm -hmm. the answer to everything, or is it mm -hmm. just another dead end or whatever? Um, yeah. But... What, yeah. what? And then an allusion to the the sight reading thing that she does at the beginning. So it, I, I haven't figured out what the metaphor means there exactly, but I I still had a kind of ICU movie moment. She she's not a musician, right? <laughs> like I don't know. Like the sight reading thing was like a she's line. She's certainly not a pianist. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it was like a line that you'd hear in like Tar or something, right? But like I, I was like, you're not mm -hmm. you're not about to drop this like sight reading like analogy and then never allude to the fact that you play even an instrument at all <laughs> like it, she might as well start that sentence with i've heard about this thing that people call sight reading i like the idea i of think it. in the movie she was a musician but we don't know anything anything about it yeah we know she's a dancer i will say in maybe it was my imagination but in the final bit I, even though it's the final shot, I feel like it's not a spoiler because it's just, how could you spoil this movie? Um, she's playing piano in the final shot and she is sight reading and it starts with the kind of shaky thing that I would probably do if I were sight reading. And then I swear by like a minute in, she's playing with multiple hands and it feels way more confident. And I think the movie is kind of saying like, she like gets the rhythm and then takes over whatever she's doing so i think she could actually be a great musician in the movie <laughs> she's just shaky at first <laughs> cool i i just want to know who is in the minivan at the end just kidding mm. <laughs> we'll never know that was, i think that was a joke just for you i i get it <laughs> um all right should we get should we get to verdict steven the, the one last thing I want to say is there is a scene in this movie featuring trying to fall asleep with a grandmother next to you that I thought was like, if this were the, <laughs> oh the pure drama of how does it feel to meet your biological parents and the awkward mix of feeling strong emotions and then also not knowing them at all, that would be like the perfect scene in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that was so great. <laughs> in the broader context of the movie, I, it ebbs and flows in so many different ways. I don't know, but um, I did love that moment. Yeah, I, no, that was pretty good. Like grandma praying, but, but you're in the room and you're awake and you can hear her. <laughs> She's yep. like touching you and stuff. Oh, so good. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, Stephen, let's get to our verdicts for this film. If you're going to give this a must-see, recommend the caveat, wait for until pass to the caveat, or must avoid, what would you give it? Uh, I... It depends on how literally I want to take our reviews. I'm going to take it not literally and say must-see, because I really, really loved this movie. I thought it was so inventive and interesting, and it made me feel things. And it, I, I had about an hour after this movie where I was walking. I was going to maybe pick up dinner, or I was maybe going to try to catch a bus or the Muni or something and go home. And instead, I was just, like, walking, thinking about the movie. And it, I, I just really value when a movie can can do that to me so i really loved it um i didn't name the director but davy chow made it i am unfamiliar with his work but i think the style of the movie is just incredible uh, i should give it a recommend with a caveat with the caveat being this is a thorny movie that is not going to give you the kind of emotions that the setup makes it seem like it is going to give you and i fully understand if it does not work <laughs> yeah, yeah for me it worked wonderfully though yeah can you imagine steven swiping on a dating app and then becoming <laughs> an arms dealer <laughs> i wish <laughs> um yeah for me i'm going to give it a wait for rental i think that people who don't have the hang-ups that i do about like conceptualizing the emotional nature of uh belonging or not belonging to a found family versus a biological family um will probably enjoy this film a little bit more than i did um like i said 80 percent of the first 60 percent of this film i enjoyed genuinely um mm -hmm. i i was totally on board for where it was going um i just i wanted her to be nicer to that old man <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't want whatever happened when it jumped forward in the future to happen. But then when you jump again, you get to see her be nicer to the man. So you kind you kind of get what you want. Also, also is there is there a weird... I, there was some weird time stuff that was happening. Cause it, it, like when we first meet the... the there, there is like a woman and a guy that she hangs out with. Um, yeah. And when they first meet... It almost feels like she runs uh, in that she's checking into, right? She's like, oh, mm -hmm. how long are you staying? Yeah, she works at the hotel. Yeah. But, like, they're just friends from the next scene on. Like, and they refer to each other as, like, oh, yeah, I'm her friend. And maybe that's just, like, colloquial for, like, I know this person. She's with me. Don't worry about it. You know, like, it, it just it felt weird that it was, like, when it started off, I was, like, you're, you're just a, a host who is taking her around the city for one night. But then they're constantly there and they talk as though they like were either in a like adoption home together or went to school. Like they 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 treat each other as though they're longtime friends and she's returning to the city to hang out with her friend, even though the first thing they clearly have never met before. And I was like, there was weird stuff like that. I, I think that young woman was just being friendly, taking her out, and then she was kind of captivated by her energy or saw her as a bird with a broken wing that she wanted to help out and that is kind of the moment the movie changes into the movie you don't like is when freddie is basically saying no fuck that i own this movie <laughs> um, <laughs> but i do i do believe they don't have any history yeah. uh, and that they're anything else she says is just to be supportive to her in front of um her biological family there was also this funny moment where uh, she's walking around the city with like a, an actual like fold out map. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. so this is like a period piece of sorts. <laughs> and then she takes a yeah. Skype call from her phone. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm watching now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it did. I do. I know we already did the review, by the way, but I want to say just how much I love the dance sequence. <laughs> like not just because I love a dance sequence, but the, the <laughs> specific way that Freddie or Jimin Park dance, it's like, it isn't like feeling the music and flowing elegantly. This isn't Magic Mike. I told you I'm going to mention it in every movie we review now. <laughs> um, it's like she has this like force. Yeah. She wants so badly for it to be a dance, for it to be a rave. She's just like pumping her arms. She's moving around. She's looking around and smiling as if everyone else is going to be vibing off her energy. And she's just like 
taking control of the entire movie. And I, I really, really, really loved that sequence. <laughs> While that scene was happening. I wanted to shake my fist and dance. Yeah. While that scene was happening, I was like, this is Steven's favorite movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that scene, I was like, Steven loves this movie. The very next scene, you were like, Chris hates this movie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They were so close. And that's the podcast in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is going to do it for a review of Return to Soul. Stephen Miller, people want to find you throughout the week. Where can they do that? People can find me at twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com. People can find me at christopherinreallife.com or twitter.com slash christopherirl. You can find the podcast over at thespoilerwarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so in Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. If you want to know when the episodes go live, you can follow us at twitter.com slash spoilerwarning, facebook.com slash thespoilerwarning, or instagram.com slash thespoilerwarning. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can send an email to fans at thespoilerwarning.com, or you can use the contact form on our site. Music for this episode will come from a track selected from Artlist.io, so hopefully you're enjoying that. And uh, yeah, we're off. Those are our reviews for the week, and we'll be back uh, soon with another review. Later. Bye. Keep on going, cause we're all